My name is Justin Coletti. Thank you for coming to MixCon. Is anyone here by chance here to see Tony Maserati? All right, good. For a second there, I thought, oh, that was for me. Apparently not. All right, Tony Maserati, for those of you who don't know who he is, for, I don't know who you are and why you don't know who he is, but he is a 10-time Grammy-nominated mixer. He really came into notoriety working with some of the biggest hip-hop artists, particularly on the East Coast, Puff Daddy and Queen Latifah and Notorious B.I.G. and all these names of East Coast hip-hop. He was all over that scene. And since then, he's become just as big, if not even bigger, in the world of pop music mixing. Major releases from Beyonce, major releases from Jason Mraz, Black Eyed Peas, Usher. Uh, man, I'm going to leave so many out, I'm sure. I'm super excited to have him on. He is going to take us under the hood of some real commercial mixes from an artist client of his named Debbie Nova. So big thanks to Debbie Nova for letting us hear some of her tracks. Can you give a round of applause for her? For those of you watching on video, we'll be sure to link to her stuff if you want to hear these songs in full, but we'll be going under the hood. There's one last big thanks we have to give before we can bring Tony on, and that is to our sponsor for this presentation, without whom this event would not be free to the public like it is. So a big thanks for making this free to the public, Mick DSP. Thanks to those guys. Big round of applause to Mick DSP. When digital audio was new, Mick DSP was one of like, the first brands that actually made good sounding plugins. Before the days of Mick DSP, there were plugins. A lot of them didn't sound that great until Mick DSP came along. Now there's a lot of great plugin companies, so Mick DSP is doing something else that is extremely unusual. They have unveiled a box here right before we got started called the APB16. They actually put a photo of it there behind me, which is kind of neat. It's like an all analog compressor that you hook up to your computer via Thunderbolt, and you can use 16 channels of analog compression like they're plugins in your DAW, like as if it was a DSP processor, but it's all analog. That's just mind-bending. Can we give an applause for how mind-bendingly weird and awesome that is? <laughs> all right, enough of me yakking. Thanks to all those guys. Thanks to you for coming, and thanks to Tony Maserati, who's gonna take it away from here. Thank you, Tony. I've never been here before, so in fact, I saw the studio for the first time, and I remember my good friend Jimmy Douglas works here all the time. I'd never come to visit him. Then again, I don't think he ever came to visit me either, but we always see each other at events. This is uh, an amazing space. I appreciate you all for coming, really. This is amazing. Wow. I guess. It, it'd be good for me to know a little bit about who y'all are. So just by a show of hands, uh, engineers in the room? Engineer people? OK, cool. Producers? OK, kind of both, almost. How about artists? Jeez, whoa, OK. You know, obviously, the reason why I ask is because I want to know how, how I, what kind of language I should and could use. Uh, you know, I just released a few records. Does anybody know those records? Should I talk about those records a little bit? Yeah? yeah? So a little Beyonce stuff. The, I did three tracks on the gift that she just released, which was always, as always, pretty amazing to work with her. And uh, I think just today or yesterday, uh, uh, an artist named Bryce Vine just dropped his album. And I had four tracks on that. And also a new artist, uh, Carlos Vera, just dropped his single. And I, I think I had a couple last week as well. One of the things, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because, you know, a large part of what I do is paying attention to what is released. And not only what is released, what is being accepted by an audience, right? Because not only do I work for B or Bryce or Carlos, I work for the audience. 
the people who are actually paying attention to the work that I do. And in some cases, they're paying attention more than the, the executives. <laughs> and and that, that's how it should be. The audience is the one who are, who are really telling me whether or not I'm doing a good job. They're the ones keeping me in the seat. I, I think this is one of the things that that whenever I'm speaking to an audience of, of uh, younger producer engineers and artists, they, they, they feel like there's a disconnect. You know, they think that there is some magic wand that I'm, I'm putting over the music and, and it becomes this mix and immediately people love it. I have had lots of flops. And, and I think that the average for any professional who has done it as long as I have is that it's probably either 50-50 or 60-40, you know, if you've lasted as long as me, maybe. It, there are a lot of records that come out that you all don't know anything about. And some of them I thought were amazing records that I did my best work on. And, and some of them, some of the biggest hits I've done have been records that I uh, didn't really think were going to do anything. There is a record in particular, I, I don't even remember the name of the, the group, but the, the, I can never forget the song, and it's called Candy Rain. And, and Heavy D produced it, and, and he was, he's an amazing guy, he was an amazing guy. And, and I swear he played me that song and I was like, oh, I hate this song. I can't, do I, what am I supposed to do with this? And he's like, dude, just do your thing. And I'm like, oh, I, 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 can I, you know, so I would mix it in pieces and just the keys and just the drums and, and then maybe I'd move on to the background vocals and that sort of thing. But of course it, it was a gigantic record for, for Hev and his production company. And, and the band. Um, thank you. So for real. That's right. Yeah. And it was, and it was great. And of course, I'm, I'm happy for them. I'm, I'm happy that I was involved. But I'll never understand how that record did as well as it did. <laughs> so I think it goes both ways. There are a lot of records I've done that I thought, wow, this is, this, people are going to get this you know, and put my heart and soul into it. Not that I didn't for Soul For Real. So I think that there is, there's a really important element here that has, has been part of my life, and that is I, I try my best to pay attention to the audience. And of course, I have a lot of help with that. The producers I'm working with, the, the artists, I get the ones that I get a chance to, to be around, and, um, and certainly the younger members of my, my engineering team as well. And I, I try to do my best to stay on top of what's being released. It's a little harder now, as you all know. It's, I mean, the amount of releases per week is, is probably 10 times what it was 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Back then, we knew exactly who was being released you know, three months in advance. So releases could be scheduled around other artists who were competitive. And nowadays, that doesn't happen. The B record that we just did was released two days, maybe even hours after I finished. And I know the Carter's record that, that we did last year, I, I think my assistant was whispering in my ear, you have to print, you have to print. And literally, it came out that night. So things are much different nowadays. And I think that one of the things that I'm, I'm lucky enough to have is, is my clients and my, my artists believe in the fact that I am paying attention to the audience. And I am also obviously paying attention to their creativity. I think today, this is, this is kind of what I wanted to get into a little bit with, with some of the demonstration I'll do with Debbie's record. Debbie is, a, is an old friend, a client, an artist. Uh, she started out with doing her own music. She was on Sony US, and she was singing in English. 
and she was working with Ricky Martin and a variety of other uh, Latin artists. She's from Costa Rica. And uh, I worked on a couple records with her. And she came to me for the, this new record because we know each other and she knows that I still do what I do. And, you know, she knew that she needed a proper mix. I think she had mixed it in Mexico and she didn't like what, what she ended up with. I have been very lucky in that, you know, I have a lot of clients who have been with me for a long time. And one of the things that, that I'll talk about also quite a lot today is the idea of this staying in touch. Not staying in touch with Debbie, because I hadn't talked to her in three years or four years, but staying in touch with the audience. And in some ways, it's more important for me to do that than it is to make sure that, that Debbie still has my phone number. One, because it's easy to get a hold of me, and, and uh, social media and, and, and the digital world has made that easy. But also because the audience is, is really who I'm playing to, right? It's who the, the artist is playing to, it's who the producer is playing to, it's who the record company is playing to. It really is, is, and especially nowadays, is everything. The audience, and the audience is fluid, right? The audience is changing at all times. The, what they're interested in, what they pay attention to. It used to be that I could get away with using a kick drum for six months, a particular sounding kick drum, say or a, a bank of samples that I may have worked on and created myself or maybe shared with my, my uh, producer friends. You know, that doesn't work anymore. Things move so fast now, people can tell if it's six weeks old, forget about six months old. You know, the sonics of, of music moves extremely fast. How many, I mean, I'm assuming all of you you know, get your, get your plugins, get your software online. How often is that stuff updated? It's updated, what, every couple weeks? There's a new update of something, whether it's, a, whether it's an OS or, or a, a, you, know, you know, people are making their, their software more compatible with, with the new computers or the new drivers or whatever it is. But the same goes for music, right? The sound itself is changing. So that means discovering plugins, discovering technology. Now I actually have to spend time discovering technology, which brings me to the point I was trying to make, which took me so long to get there. And, and that is, it's studying and practice. And I don't know, I'm assuming a fair bit of this crowd is professional and your music is released. Raise your hand if you have your music released. Okay, half, I'd say. So your music, you create music or you, you engineer music, you write music, and it gets released. Well, you, the rest of you, or actually all of you, including myself, I spend, you should spend a lot of time practicing and a lot of time listening, and a lot of time paying attention to what new technologies have come out. This, I, I can't tell you how important this is from the beginning stages of my career to this afternoon, you know, and what I learned talking to Colin upstairs about the, the APB box, you know, that, that sort of level of you know, curiosity and interest, both in the technology, in the craft itself, and, and in the musicality. The way that, you know, what's his name? Phineas from Billie Eilish, Billie's brother, right? The way that we've all, we've all been enthralled with what he did to the 808. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? You don't know what I'm talking about? Don't know what I'm talking about? Okay. So you gotta, you gotta 
check out this Billie Eilish record, of course, and, and Phineas, her brother, is that his name, Phineas, right? Yeah. So, um, but what he did to the 808 just seems to be the thing that everyone is talking about. How did he do this? What did he do? What was the impetus to this? Was it a mistake that he then said, oh, that's super cool, I'm going to use this? But he completely distorted it, but it doesn't sound unpleasantly distorted. It actually becomes part of the sonic quality and also part of, it, part of the mood of the song, it's, it, which is, you know, this is brilliance. This is what, you know, musical brilliance is all about. It's about experimentation. It's about keeping things interesting in any way possible. You know, when I first started, we spent a lot of time learning how to use uh, tape. Of course, those days are long gone. I am happy that they are long gone because I will never work on tape again, thank you. But I'm certainly enthralled by a box like this that allows me to have control over an analog circuit from my DAW without having hardware I.O. involved. I, I don't know if any of you have followed what I do, but I do a, a thing called hybrid mixing, so, which means that I, I have a, racks of analog equipment. They're hooked in to my system through an interface. I use an HDIO from Avid. So I'll, I'll grab a 33609 Neve compressor, an analog compressor, through a, a plug-in insert. Obviously, I don't have anything. I don't have any analog gear here, but um, does this screen show up over there? So you can see that one of the things that I have plugged in here is insert seven and eight. And I also use insert three and four, not that we can use them because they don't exist here. But in my system, those are analog compressors. So I can instantiate analog compression or EQ wherever there's a plug-in point. And then it, I've set up my I.O. system so that I have a setup of hardware inserts in my I.O. setup. This allows me to get some analog compression, some analog equalization, which I really still enjoy within my, the framework of my digital mixing system, right? Because I still do all my automation and all my, my mixing within the DAW. Although sometimes I actually go external with the summing. And I do that by way of my auxes. So I can essentially mix in the box like this and have my auxes go to what I'm calling mix bus. And that mix bus shows up here as an input. And that's basically my internal mixing system, right? But if I want to sum, then I just select my converter. My, my, in my case, it's a, it's a lavery. I would select that, and then I would send each one of these to, I have a little Neve sidecar. I have an EMI Chandler mini mixer. I have a fulcrum mixer, a passive box. So my system is really fluid. I can move around, and, and if I decide that the mix would sound better summed through an analog amplifier, right? Because that's what we're talking about here, right? You understand the difference. Because if I'm mixing in the box, it's all summed digitally. And that's the difference. Rather than sending it to my Neve, which of course goes through my converter and then goes through the St. Ives transformers to the input of my Neve console or the transformers that are in the EMI Chandler mini mixer. So I get that sound and then that is summed and then sent back digitally via my Lavery. 
the flexibility that I get from that is what I really like. My friend Stu White, who, who does most of the Beyonce stuff, I said to him, oh man, you've got to check out this APB box, and you know, maybe you should, we should send some of your mixes through my analog setup and check it out and see if it makes it sound better. And he's like, no way, man. I'm keeping my stuff all in the box. You know, if, if, if Chad Blake can do it, I'm going to do it. And he makes a good point because Chad Blake mixes all in the box. But Chad Blake is Chad Blake. He's just amazing. And yeah, he, mi he mixes all in the box, and I don't know how he does it, but it sounds amazing. I mix in the box quite often, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll mix like on my laptop. Uh, in fact, this week I'm, I'm gonna be away from my studio, so I'll mix in my laptop and then I'll send my file back to my assistant in LA. You know, I'll give him instruction on where to send things and he'll put it through the analog gear and we'll listen to that and see if that's better or worse and see if it makes it, you know, a bit fuller, a bit rounder. And I find that quite often the analog setup really does help with making it a bit wider, giving me a bit more depth in the mix. And I really enjoy that. Sonically, the B stuff actually, um, you know, her stuff is is really put together well by Stuart. So when he sends me a file, I, I, there isn't a lot I can do to that file because one, B works and does updates up until minutes before it's released. So I can't really change too much because Stu might need to print something new and then send that to me and it goes on like that. So it's really important for me to kind of keep his construct together. Um, so I try to retrofit it into my structure, but I can't always do that. But in the case of the new record, I really just chose the points like he had sort of a vocal, an all vocal submix. And I said, well, okay, that's not gonna work for me. Let me duplicate that and then send her lead vocals out through the Chandler Mini Mixer, send the backgrounds out through the Chandler Mini Mixer. And then he's got like an, an all music submix as well. Okay, that's not gonna work. Let me duplicate that and then just send the drums to the new one and send the drums out to the Neve. And you get my point. So I'm choosing, picking and choosing the, the, the points at which I'm changing his setup. And then I'm, I'm sending it to my you know, choices. And sometimes those choices are just based on the transformers. They're not even, I'm not even gonna change the EQ. I'm just going to listen to it through the transformers. And, and then through, I've got a pair of V76 amplifiers, which have tubes in them, so I'm going to listen to that. So you get my point that quite often, if, if you all are mixers, you'll know, you get a file that the producer has spent days maybe even months working on. And that might be a, what he considers to be a mix. So is it your job to break that down and print stems and, and then mix it? Or is it your job to sort of make use of his ideas? I kind of choose the latter. I like doing it that way because then I get to sort of dissect why and what he did, or she, and try to make it better. Um, and I do this quite often, actually. I guess that's an interesting segue in the idea of this APB that Colin made at McDSP. Have, any, have, have you guys checked this thing out yet? Couple? Couple folks. So this box is 
is this green box here, and it's connected with just Thunderbolt, right? Can I, can I now save and automate a piece of analog equipment from within my DAW? Now I can. And, and Colin has made a box, this simple, you know, 1U box here that's pretty light. It's got 16 channels of hardware compression in it. And, um, you know, uh, I think um, we can possibly get into more about how that works, but I imagine that Colin's website probably has a lot more information than I can disseminate right now. But this is the future. This is the way, for me, again, I like the, I like the sound of an analog compressor. I'm hoping that eventually Colin will get into equalization, saturation, and a few other things. But right now, this is the way you can control and automate an analog device within your DAW. That's not doable in any other way. So how would I characterize the type of compression in this box? It's actually really interesting because, and you can imagine, this is what's necessary. What Colin did was he made a very, very high quality box. So it's got 32-bit conversion internally, 32-bit conversion, and, and high quality uh, components. And then he manipulates them through software to do things that emulate our favorite compressors. In this case, this is probably emulating something that is similar to a Fairchild, right? because of its name, I'm only assuming. Does it sound like a Fairchild? No. He's not suggesting that it sounds like a Fairchild, thus it doesn't have the exact same logo and name. But he, because he's created a system within the analog circuitry, there are points within that circuitry where he is calling upon particular bits of the circuitry to mimic the attack and release time of a particular kind of compressor. And of course, the, the sky's the limit on what other programmers would do with this type of box. So I think that the future is in what can a programmer do with this now, you know? And that's kind of super interesting to me because Colin has created a really high quality analog circuitry that is digitally controlled. So, so the question is, is there a need for analog equipment? You know what? That's a choice. It really is. It's, it's a taste. It's a choice. I believe I, I work better within the framework of, of what I do, and that is incorporating both the digital and the analog together. As I said before, I'm not interested in, in going back to um, analog tape. That's for damn sure. Um, but I do, I do like the sound. I, I, I mean, listen to, I mixed three songs that were three songs that got released for B. Those three songs, I, I can't tell you what the, the Chandler RS124 did. It made it. It made the sound of her voice. It, when I listen to those records, I hear the RS-124. And I don't know that that is something that I can get yet from a box. Maybe, maybe somebody, maybe, you know, Chandler's gonna license something and, and somebody will come out with it. But I, I, I've tried, trust me, because I only have two and I wish I had four, you know? But if I, had, if I had four, I would use four. That's how good the box is. That's what it does for my life. So is that something I can get from a plug-in? Maybe. I, if anybody knows, Chad Blake knows. But not me, because I haven't found it yet. I, I often come to these events without a clue of what I'm going to do. <laughs> and this, this is no difference, because I was working. To, in fact, I, I arrived here late last night. And as soon as I got here, I got a message from a producer 
And, and he said, yeah, what happened to the panning on that vocal ad lib? And, and of course, I was like, what panning? And my assistant had deleted some panning of a particular vocal ad lib. And, and so I was working until 2 AM. I wasn't saying that as an excuse that I am, I am not going to in, you know, be as impressive with my mixing today. I, I meant it more to the point of, I, I think that I'm probably much like y'all. And that is, I got my head in this, in this thing every day for 15 hours a day. And as much as possible, I try to plan out moments of where I'm going to explore new plugins or listen to new released music or have a discussion with my, uh, my friends about what direction our engineering industry is going and, and how can I keep up. So I think that that is something that, in as much as I can sit here and try to demonstrate things that I do, I, I think that this is so important. Obviously, coming here and talking to me, hopefully you're going to walk away, even with the, the smallest tidbit of information that you can then go home or to your studio and, and try and utilize and practice it and try to figure out how can I make use of this info. I can't stress enough how important it is for you to find and allocate time for yourself to practice. And, and by practice, I mean practice with your system, but also experiment and listen to music and, and read information about you know, your colleagues and mine as to how they do things and see if there are ways for you to incorporate that into your work. So Debbie is an awesome writer. And one of the reasons why I am working with her is because of that. And not only is she an awesome writer, she is an amazing singer and musician. I work on a lot of music. And, and I think that one of the reasons why I wanted to bring Debbie's music in here to demonstrate is because it came to me at a place that I felt I really could do a lot to it to bring out what, what hopefully she was looking for. Uh, this record is not out. It probably won't come out for, I don't know, a few months. She has, she's really nice in letting me use her file. She uh, co-produced the record, as I said, and performs on it. And one of the things that I do immediately when I get a record is my team, they'll basically get a file from the producer and then they'll, they'll put my template. And by template, I mean my uh, I.O. setup. Uh, also, a bunch of auxes that I, that I keep in my template. And you'll notice down below here, I've got a bunch of auxes that are inactive. And those are part of my template. And so whenever I have an idea, I grab something on my template and I turn it on and I use that thing and sometimes I edit it, sometimes I don't edit it. Sometimes I have holes in my template. So here you see something called extra mono delay. And that just means it's blank when I open up my session and I throw something on there that I like and I use that. And I have extra delay, which is a stereo delay and I use that and I have extra reverb and basically, there's a bunch of stuff that I use. Here's one that I call extra verb, and I'll just grab something that I like, and I throw that on and, and start to work with that. In this case, I'm going to put that guy on. How many of you use a template? Anybody? Anybody use a template? OK. So you use a template. That's good. I find it, it allows me to work fast. So generally, what I do is I spend quite a lot of time just listening to the record and listening to the tracks. I try to spend as little time in front of the speakers as possible. Mm -hmm. 
and then I, I make mental notes. And, I, and those mental notes can be regarding the mood that the song puts me in. It could be mental notes about a chain that I want to create and I want to work out later. But I find that being able to visualize the sound that I want, and by visualize, I mean that could be the room, right? So maybe if I'm thinking about what room do I want that snare drum to be in, I'm thinking about are the walls made of wood or are the walls made of plaster? Is the ceiling high or low? Is there wood on the floor, right? These are, these are the kinds of things that, are, that I'm hearing in my head. I'm not thinking about a plug-in, right? I'm thinking about what kind of wood. And, and, and I'm also thinking about what is the finish on the wood, right? Is there any fabric involved in this room, right? How big is the room? Because that's going to tell me how my delay is going to work. Is there a delay? And then, of course, I can start to think about where am I placing the microphones? I'm sure most of you have tried out the UAD Oceanway plugin, where they, you get to move the microphone around. Have, have you guys seen this plugin? Anybody not seen it? Anybody not seen this plugin? Okay. So you gotta, you gotta check it out. You probably find a demo online or whatever. But it's a really smart, interesting plugin that is, is emulating this ocean waste space and then moving, allowing you to, to choose the microphone and move the microphone within that space, which I think is super cool. I remember when they were developing it and the engineer was asking me what I thought might be what what might make it more interesting, and um, I think they did a, a terrific job at creating that. But that's a lot of the process that I'm thinking. So when I'm listening down to the track over and over again, I'm thinking about those things. How do I want this snare to sound? Where do I want it to sit? Or vo where do I want the vocal to be? And then of course I start to think about the arrangement as well, right? I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, does, does the vocal need to be dry in the beginning and then get bigger at the end? Or, you know, do I start her off immediately in a big room? Because that changes the mood immediately, right? In, in the case of this mix, I started her off quite dry. But I'd like to actually mess around with, okay, so we put that on here. Should we listen to this thing? Because you guys haven't heard this thing yet, right? Okay. Oh wow, okay. I don't know if you can hear it, but in my headphones I can actually hear the difference. It kind of lifts up the low end in a really interesting way. Let's throw another one on just for, for the hell of it. Yeah, this one's kind of interesting. I use this one on vocal all the time, actually. But why don't we just put it on her vocal? So I've got this guy on her vocal already, because that's what I used in the mix. So let's just A, B and listen to it a little bit. Y no me queda fuerza ni para 
llorar Tengo que soltarte Continuar Juro que en las noches Siento tu calor Sueño que hasta te puedo tocar eh. Y quiero creerlo, quiero creerlo, quiero creerlo Que estás aquí, eh, que estás aquí, eh That does a nice job. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but in my phones I'm like, wow, that shit sounds great. Um, but, um, so, so, I mean, again, you, you, you got to dig into this, this box. I think it's super cool. I've been using it for six weeks. I'm loving it. Colin's little uh, small session that he did upstairs really kind of blew my mind. I got more information on it now and know a little bit more about what it does. I also used it on a mix bus, which I thought was really cool. And we can mess with that later. But for now, I'm just going to leave this. I do want to mess with the reverb thing that, that I put up there. And I think I put it on extra verb. I'm going to turn the other stuff off. Because as we were, as I was playing the track, I realized that, that, that one approach that I may have missed when I mixed this record was there, there's a real sadness that's in the track that I'm not sure I'm, I'm accentuating in her vocal sound. Of course, this is, there are so many different directions we can go, but I want to I wanna try to mess around with where this goes uh, if I just mess with this idea that came in my head. Whatever that ends up being, I don't know. I always start off with a, with a preset, because I don't know why. I just like to. Maybe I like seeing a name, but uh, I'm going to start with this guy. Again, going back to what I was talking about earlier regarding, in my head, I'm visualizing what I want this to sound like. So I'm visualizing space, the size of the space, the kinds of floor, the materials involved in that space. I brought up this plugin because I thought this is a really interesting way that they've created this plugin by allowing you to determine what the materials involved in the space are. Uh, I just love that idea. And that kind of works with the way my brain works when I'm thinking about space. Um, but in this case, I want to see if I can make her sound lonely. Okay, that's the, that's the best way that I can describe the sound in my head. And uh, so I don't know if I can do that, but uh, you know, having a big open space, maybe that's going to help. aquí
Y no me queda fuerza ni para llorar. Y no me queda fuerza ni para llorar. Tengo que saltarte continuar. So quite often I spend a lot of time doing what I call a broad strokes. And that's because I'm not trying to succeed at anything. I'm really simply trying to get the idea in my head out. That's it. I'm not trying to finish the whole detail. I'm simply trying to get the idea out. And every stroke that I make is telling me that's part of the sound that I'm looking for or not. Ni para llorar, tengo que saltarte continuar. Juro que en las noches siento tu calor, sueño que hasta te puedo tocar. Eh. I really dislike sending anything in pre, it goes against everything I believe in. <laughs> It also makes printing stems a real bitch. Y no me queda fuerza ni para Tengo que saltar. Okay, so uh, the idea of envisioning the sound in your head comes from the mood, right? It's, it's the feeling. There was a record on the Carters, uh, a song on the Carters record that I did last year, and um, there was a process involved in this in the production of that record. There were quite a there was four engineers involved. There was a lot of work that went into involved in the record in a very short period of time. And we were all in London. Guru was um, mixing a song. Well, he was actually recording and mixing a song um, that it ended up B had put her her. Uh, vocals on late and he had very little time to to mix it and I had heard the song early on when I first arrived in London he had already been working on it for, for weeks recording and, and 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 arranging and doing all sorts of things Guru does quite a lot for for Jay and I had heard the song and of course I, I was like oh god I want to mix this song you know but I didn't say anything 
And in the end, he didn't have the time to finish it. And, but they gave it to me, and I only had like literally four hours, I think, they had for me to do that. But during, during the week that I was there, maybe two weeks, I don't even remember how long it was because it's all a blur, but I had mixed the whole record in my head. Every sound, every track, I had mixed in my head. And I, I practiced this technique when I was an assistant engineer. I, I know that we don't really have that process anymore in the business where there's an assistant and, and, a, and, a, and a master engineer that you learn from. But that's how I came up. And, and I'm not saying that it was, a, it was a epiphany or anything. I just hated, you know, I had to sit in the room. And I hated it. So I would just mix in my head. So the, this engineer, his, his, name, his, name is, um, his name is Doc Dockerty. And he used to smoke Winston's and drink, uh, drink beer while he, while he mixed. And so my job was pretty much just doing patches, um, writing down you know, settings on the equipment, and going out and getting him Winston's and beer. And that was my job. So you can imagine how bored I was um, every time I had to assist Doc, which was all the time. And he was really an amazing uh, mixer. In fact, to this day, I don't know how he did what he did. Um, but as it stands, I'm not sure I ever spent the time to figure out how he did what he did because I was so bored. And I would just spend my time sitting in the back of the room going, OK, I'm going to put the snare through this reverb, and I'm going to set this, and I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to send it through you know, this guitar pedal, and it's going to do this for this one spot. You know what I mean? And I would do that in my head all the time, to the point where I started writing down what I was going to do. And that included the patching, the patch cable, the length of cable, the kind of cable, balanced, unbalanced, everything about it. I would patch it in my head, because it was so boring to sit there and just Doc would work on the snare for two hours. And I just couldn't stand it after a while. There was one point I said to Doc, are you really going to work on that snare some more? And he, he just said, go out and get me a pack of Winstons. <laughs> I swear to God. And, um, and he didn't say anything. He, he was, he, you know, this guy, this guy was like, um, uh, Clint Eastwood, that was his persona, but it was really him, you know, so he wouldn't say to me, shut up, you idiot, he would just say, go out and get me another pack of Winnie's, and that was, means don't be a dumbass, um, but it really helped me to, to hone that idea of mixing in my head, so as I'm sitting here and I'm poking away at this, at this idea that I've got in my head about creating a lonely sound for her, I'm realizing, okay, great, this is going to be good, but it's not going to work for the whole song, of course. So how, and it's not going to work with the current arrangement of the song. So then my head starts to go to, okay, do I change the arrangement and just move it down to like, in a section maybe, it's just going to be the roads, or the guitar, which I'm gonna maybe put in the, the same space as her. And then I'm gonna bring that back, okay? All of these details you should be able to do in your head. All the settings that, that you change in the box, you should be able to see them in your mind. You should be able to do this all in your head. Just by coming up with a simple idea, a simple sound, you should have all of these settings. And the way to get there is with practice. And that's what I did. So after Doc left the studio, and he would say, OK, make sure the recall is right, then I would stay all night and get my mix 
on the board, the one that was in my head, that I had written down, the things that I had in my, my head, in my ear, I would, I would do and try to get to. And that was my practice. So I would spend a lot of time practicing and trying to get those ideas out. So I can't really speak more importantly about, about how practice is really important, how listening to other music. And I used to listen to mixes by whoever you know, was out and my favorite mixers. And I would write down what I thought they did, down to the cable, down to the kind of guitar strings, everything I would write down. Now, none of that was probably true, what I wrote down. But what it did was it trained my ear to say, oh, I want the sound that Bob Clearmountain got on this In Excess record on the kick drum. And I'm sure Bob didn't do anything that was in my head. I didn't get it right, but I had an idea. And that's how those ideas get created. They don't get created by floundering around on your DAW. They get created by coming up with an idea in your head. And that was my original point when I said, I spend a lot of time listening. So I'll sit there and listen. And I'll, I'll look at my second and I'll say, what does this remind you of? And then we'll listen to that song. And I'll think, what does this remind me of? And I'll listen to that song. And I'll, maybe I'll grab a delay setting from that song. Or maybe I'll come up with a kick drum sound for the, the bridge that is similar to this other song. Or whatever it is. I might utilize those references in the same way that a poet or a visual artist will utilize references to something else. Right? Do you understand where I'm going? Does anybody have a question about that? Yeah. Going back to the mood, those understanding the lyrics of the song, in this case, other language. Do you not understand this? Do you speak Spanish? You speak Spanish. How many of you do not speak Spanish? Does anybody unclear about the mood of this song? You're unclear. What do you think the mood of the song is? Does everybody else agree? We all agree. She sets the mood. I don't need to know the exact lyrics. I work on K-pop, I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't need to know exactly what she's saying. And I, and I do, of course, I ask her, what is this song about? And she'll explain to me. But in the end, she only needs to make sure I know if I'm going the wrong direction, right? Because if I go in the wrong direction, she'll immediately say, what the hell are you doing? But if I go in the right direction, she's already told me what the direction is. I mean, we all, anybody who's worked in music knows, you listen to the vocalist, if she doesn't tell you, or he, in the, the way they perform it, if they don't tell you what that song is about, then they're just not good. That's, that's it, bottom line. I mean, if, if we're working on pop music and the vocalist doesn't explain by their performance what the song is about, uh, like Candy Rain, <laughs> I just didn't know what that song was about. <laughs> to this day, I'm not sure I know what that song is about. But, you get my point. Yeah. So, as a, if you're in the beginner stage, um, what are the steps and techniques you would say you would take? Say, if you have trouble like hearing the difference, like bypassing the effects and everything, and hearing the difference of what's, what's doing in the track? To, to hearing what, yeah. what's doing. Um, you know, I remember I, I played guitar, and I went to Berkeley, and the teachers at Berkeley were amazing musicians. 
And at, in those days at Berkeley, you had to play an instrument. I don't know if you do anymore. And I really sucked. And the, and the teachers were really good. And I remember the teacher saying to me, why are you playing? And I'd be like, well, it's my turn or something. <laughs> it's my spot. <laughs> and he's like, no, you don't have a clue what you're doing or why you're doing it. So to, to dissect what you want to do, you have to train your ear. And by training your ear as an engineer, I mean you have to train your ear to know different sounds, right? So if you're a beginner, you should not be mixing. You should be training your ear. You should be spending time with every plugin you can find, with every piece of hardware you can find that is emulated as a plugin and understand what their differences are. You should be spending time listening to other music. Can you pick out the instruments in a song? Start from there. That's ear training. Can you pick out every instrument in a song? And then can you pick out what box they came from? Can you pick out exactly what soft synth and what setting? Can you do that? That's training your ear. And trust me, there's people in this room who can do that. Right? And, and of course, you know, when, when most music was made by musicians, an engineer could tell what kind of bass it was, the exact kind of bass, what kind of strings were on that bass everything about it they could hear. If you can't hear at that level, then how can you come up with an idea for a sound of a vocal? Right? How can you come up with an idea for a sound for a bass? So when I'm messing with a bass, I'm thinking, oh, I want to put old strings on this bass. Or I, wanna, I, wanna, I want one of the pickups to be fucked up. You know, like a bad chord. And that's what I'm thinking in my head. How can I mess with this in a particular way that gives me this feeling? So you've got to train your ear first so that those sounds are all logged in. There's a big file in there going, OK, bad chord, bad pickup, old strings. And that comes out. Well, that's what you hope comes out. Sometimes it doesn't come out and something better comes out. And you say, oh shit, that's got brand new strings on it, but, an old, you know, but one bad pickup. You know, I don't know. These are the kinds of things that you've got to be able to hear in your head. So ear training is the thing to be doing if you're just starting out. Because mastering how to use the gear, the stuff, that's easy. That's easy. Tony, I think that was a great answer. I think that's unfortunately all the time we have left. So big thank you to Tony Maserati. I also want, if you can give us one more round of applause to the people who were able to sponsor this so it could be free to the public, both in person and on video. Big thank you to Mick DSP for bringing Tony here.